Chapter 1 On the Arizona Hills I am a very old man. How old, I do not know. Possibly I am a hundred. Possibly more. But I cannot tell because I have never aged as other men. Nor do I remember any childhood. So far as I can recollect, I have always been a man. A man of about thirty. I appear today as I did forty years and more ago. And yet I feel that I cannot go on living forever. That some day I shall die the real death from which there is no resurrection. I do not know why I should fear death. I, who have died twice and am still alive, but yet I have the same horror of it as you, who have never died. And it is because of this terror of death, I believe, that I am so convinced of my mortality. And because of this conviction, I have determined to write down the story of the interesting periods of my life and my death. I cannot explain the phenomena. I can only set down here in the words of an ordinary soldier of fortune, a chronicle of the strange events that befell me during the ten years my dead body lay undiscovered in an Arizona cave. I have never told this story. Nor shall mortal man see this manuscript until after I have passed over for eternity. I know that the average human mind will not believe what it cannot grasp, and so I do not propose being pilloried by the public, the pulpit, and the press, and held up as a colossal liar when I am but telling the simple truths which some day science will substantiate. Possibly suggestions which I gained upon Mars, and the knowledge which I can set down in this chronicle, will aid in an earlier understanding of the mysteries of our sister planet, mysteries to you, but no longer mysteries to me. My name is John Carter. I am better known as Captain Jack Carter of Virginia. At the close of the Civil War, I found myself possessed of several hundred thousand dollars and a captain's commission in the cavalry's arm of an army which no longer existed, the servant of a state which vanished with the hopes of the South. Masterless, penniless, and with my only means of livelihood fighting gone, I determined to work my way to the Southwest and attempt to retrieve my fallen fortunes in a search for gold. I spent nearly a year prospecting in the company of another Confederate officer, Captain James K. Powell of Richmond. We were extremely fortunate for late in winter of 1865, after many hardships and privations, we located the most remarkable gold-bearing quartz vein that our wildest dreams had ever pictured. Powell, who was a mining engineer by education, stated that we had uncovered a million dollars' worth of ore in a trifle over three months. As our equipment was crude in the extreme, we decided that one of us must return to civilization, purchase the necessary machinery, and return with a sufficient force of men to properly work the mine. As Powell was familiar with the country, as well as with the mechanical requirements of the mining, we determined that it would be best for him to make the trip. It was agreed that I was to hold down our claim against the remote possibility of its being jumped by some wandering prospector. On March 3, 1866, Powell and I packed his provisions on two of our burrows, and bidding me goodbye, he mounted his horse, and started down the mountainside toward the valley, across which led the first stage of his journey. The morning of Powell's departure, like all Arizona mornings, clear and beautiful. I could see him and his little pack animals picking their way down the mountainside toward the valley, and all during the morning I would catch occasional glimpses of them as they topped the hogback or came out upon a level plateau. My last sight of Powell was about three in the afternoon, and he entered the shadows of a range on the opposite side of the valley. Some half-hour later, I happened to glance casually across the valley and was much surprised to note 
three little dots in about the same place I had just seen my friend and two pack animals. I'm not given to needless worrying, but the more I tried to convince myself that all was well with Powell, and that the dots I had seen on the trail were antelope or wild horses, the less I was able to assure myself. Since we had entered the territory, we had not seen a hostile Indian and we had therefore become careless in the extreme, and were wont to ridicule the stories we had heard of the great numbers of these vicious marauders that were supposed to haunt the trails, taking their toll in lives and torture of every white party which fell into their merciless clutches. Powell, I knew, was well armed and further an experienced Indian fighter. I, too, had lived and fought for years among the Sioux in the north, and I knew that the chances were small against a party of cunning trailing Apaches. Finally, I could endure the suspense no longer, and arming myself with two Colt revolvers and a carbine, I strapped two belts of cartridges about me and, catching my saddle horse, started down the trail taken by Pal in the morning. As soon as I reached comparatively level ground, I urged my mount into a canter, and continued this where the going permitted until close upon dusk I discovered the point where the other tracks joined those of Powell. They were the tracks of unshod ponies, three of them, and the ponies had been galloping. I followed rapidly until the darkness shutting down I was forced to wait upon the rising of the moon and given on an opportunity to speculate on the question of the wisdom of my chase, possibly I had conjured up impossible dangers, like some nervous old housewife, and when I should catch up to Pal, would get a good laugh for my pains. However, I am not prone to sensitiveness, and the following of a sense of duty, wherever it may lead, has always been a kind of fetish with me throughout my life which may account for the honors bestowed upon me by three republics, and decorations and friendships of an old and powerful emperor and several lesser kings, in whose service my sword has been read many a time. About nine o'clock the moon was sufficiently bright for me to proceed on my way, and I had no difficulty in following the trail at a fast walk, and in some places at a brisk trot, until, about midnight, I reached a water hole where Pal had expected to camp. I came upon the spot unexpectedly, finding it entirely deserted with no signs of having been recently occupied as a camp. I was interested to note that the tracks of the pursuing horsemen, for such as I was now convinced they must be, continued after Pal with only a brief stop at the hole for water, and always at the same rate of speed as his. I was positive now that the trailers were Apaches, and that they wished to capture Pal alive for a fiendish pleasure of torture. So I urged my horse onward at the most dangerous pace, hoping against hope that I would catch up with the red rascals before they attacked him. Further speculation was suddenly cut short by the faint report of two shots far ahead of me. I knew that Pal would need me now, if ever, and I instantly urged my horse to his topmost speed up the narrow and difficult mountain trail. I had forged ahead for perhaps a mile or more without hearing further sounds when the trail suddenly debouched onto a small open plateau near the summit of the pass. I had passed through a narrow overhanging gorge just before entering suddenly upon this tableland, and the sight of which met my eyes filled me with consternation and dismay. The little stretch of level land was white with Indian teepees, and there were probably half a thousand red warriors clustered around some object near the center of the camp. Their attention was so wholly riveted on this point of interest that they did not notice me, and I easily could have turned back into the dark recesses of the gorge and made my escape with perfect safety. The fact, however, that this thought did not occur to me until the following day removes any possible right to claim to heroism to which this narration of the episode might possibly otherwise entitle me. I do not believe that I am made of the stuff which constitutes heroes, because in all of the hundreds of instances that my voluntary acts have placed me face to face with death, 
I cannot recall a single one where any alternative step to that I took occurred to me until many hours later. My mind is evidently so constituted that I am subconsciously forced into a path of duty without recourse to tiresome mental processes. However that may be, I have never regretted that cowardice is not optional with me. In this instant, I was, of course, positive that Powell was the center of attraction. But whether I thought or acted first, I do not know. But within an instant from the moment the scene broke up into my view, I had whipped out my revolvers and was charging down upon the entire army of warriors, shooting rapidly and whooping at the top of my lungs. Single-handed, I could not have pursued better tactics for the red men, convinced by sudden surprise that not less than a regiment of regulars was upon them, turned and fled in every direction for their bows and arrows and rifles. The view which their hurried routing disclosed filled me with apprehension and with rage. Under the clear rays of the Arizona moon lay power, his body fairly bristling with the hostile arrows of the braves, that he was already dead I could not but be convinced, and yet I would have saved his body from mutilation at the hands of the Apaches as quickly as I would have saved the man himself from death. Riding close to him, I reached down from my saddle and, grasping his cartridge belt, drew him up across the withers of my mount. A backward glance convinced me that to return by way I had come would be more hazardous than to continue across the plateau. So putting spurs to my poor beast, I made a dash for the opening to the pass which I could distinguish on the far side of the tableland. The Indians had by this time discovered that I was alone and I was pursued with imprecations, arrows, and rifle balls. The fact that it is difficult to aim anything but imprecations accurately by moonlight, that they were upset by the sudden and unexpected manner of my advent and that I was rather rapidly moving target saved me from the various deadly projectiles of the enemy and permitted me to reach the shadows of the surrounding peaks before an orderly pursuit could be organized. My horse was traveling practically unguided as I knew that I had probably less knowledge of the exact location of the trail to pass in he, and thus it happened that he entered a defile which led to the summit of the range and not to pass which I had hoped would carry me to the valley and to safety. It is probable, however, that to this fact I owe my life and the remarkable experiences and the adventures which befell me during the following ten years. My first knowledge that I was on the wrong trail came when I heard the yells of the pursuing savages suddenly grow fainter and fainter off to my left. I knew then that they had passed to the left off the jagged rock formation at the edge of the plateau, to the right of which my horse had borne me in the body of Powell. I drew rein on a little level promontory overlooking the trail below and to my left and saw the party of the pursuing savages disappearing around the point of a neighboring peak. I knew the Indians would soon discover that they were on the wrong trail and that the search for me would be renewed in the right direction as soon as they located my tracks. I had gone but a short distance further when what seemed to be an excellent trail opened up around the face of a high cliff. The trail was level and quite broad and led upward in the general direction I wished to go. The cliff arose for several hundred feet on my right, and on my left was an equal and nearly perpendicular drop to the bottom of the rocky ravine. I had followed this trail for perhaps a hundred yards when a sharp turn to the right brought me to the mouth of a large cave. The opening was about four feet in the height and three to four feet wide, and at this opening the trail ended. It was now morning and with the customary lack of dawn, which is a startling characteristic of Arizona, it had become daylight almost without warning. Dismounting, I laid Powell upon the ground, but the most painstaking examination failed to review the faintest spark of life. I forced water from my canteen between his dead lips, bathed his face, and rubbed his hands, working over him continuously for the better part of an hour in the face of the fact that I knew him to be dead. I was very fond of Powell. 
He was thoroughly a man in every respect, a polished and southern gentleman, a staunch and true friend, and it was with a feeling of the deepest grief that I finally gave up on my crude endeavors at resuscitation. Leaving Powell's body where it lay on the ledge, I crept into the cave to reconnoitre. I found a large chamber, possibly a hundred feet in diameter and thirty or forty feet in height, a smooth and well-worn floor, and many other evidences that the cave had at some remote period been inhabited. The back of the cave was so lost in dense shadow that I could not distinguish whether there were openings into other apartments or not. As I was continuing my examination, I commenced to feel a pleasant drowsiness creeping over me, which I attributed to the fatigue of my long and strenuous ride, and the reaction from the excitement of the fight and the pursuit. I felt comparatively safe in my present location, as I knew that one man could defend the trail to the cave against an army. As soon as I became drowsy, that I could scarcely resist the strong desire to throw myself on the floor of the cave for a few moments' rest, but I knew that this would never do, and it would mean certain death at the hands of my red friends who might be upon me at any moment. With an effort, I started toward the opening of the cave only to reel drunkenly against the side wall and from there slip prone upon the floor.' 